Spiker came into my life kind of a, a unique way. Uh, when I was working at DuPont, they were advertising with DuPont and they had a full page ad to try and promote the car, the brand, and they, they figured that it was the, the best way. And, and, and back in like the early 2000s, I mean, DuPont was where it was at. Nobody had seen the car in person. They had seen pictures of it. Nobody had driven the car. I mean, it was, it was still a very early company and it looked like it was not even real. When we announced that we were, you know, looking for things for the auto show that year, the account executive for Spiker caught wind that there was a car making the rounds in the dealer network to try and promote, you know, do you want to sell this car? And there was a gentleman who runs an import export company called Costell. His name was Martin Button. Martin was kind of in control of Spiker. He was very good friends with Victor. He was the one that handled all the import, all the paperwork, all the accounting. Everything kind of went through Martin over in San Francisco. Martin had said there was a car there. It wasn't too far from where we were in Tampa. He says, look, you know, we'll, we'll ship it to you. Nobody had driven the car. It hadn't run. It, it, it was a show car is what we were told. The car comes in and it was car 007, purple, gorgeous, you know, open top, early CPP car. When this car came off of the transport, the presence that it just had was amazing. I mean, nobody's seen anything like center lock, aero blade wheels and all this aluminum, aubergine kind of purple was, was just phenomenal. And so we push it off the truck, we push it up the ramp, we get it inside the showroom, we're drooling over it. And just the car was great. Well, one of the aspects of the Spiker is that in one of the vents, there's a, a gas cap and it's solid aluminum, you know, unlike anything anybody had ever seen. And it's not like a Cobra aluminum door. It's a, it's an, it's a gas cap, but it's made out of solid aluminum. And so I take the gas cap off to look at it and in, in, in awe and I have it in my hand and I start to smell and I'm like, it smells like gas. I'm like, this isn't a show car. There's, there's, there's gas in this car. I put the cap back on and I realized that you know, this car must run. So then it became my life's work at that point to figure out, you know, what we can do. So I, I open the clamshell of the car up and I test the battery. I find the battery, you know, there's a switch and I find the terminals and the batteries at like, you know, 1.25 volts. It's completely dead. I put the thing on the charger, charger's working, let the trickle charger go for like a day and a half. And I come back and it's charging. The Spiker had a unique system that it used the Audi immobilizer system, you know, to run in conjunction with the Clifford alarm system as a, an anti-theft device. And the Clifford system also worked the doors that popped open, but you had to use them both kind of together. And the problem we found out was that there's a, in the earlier cars, there was a very specific sequence of arming the alarm, disarming the alarm, opening the doors, putting the Audi key into the car and turning the ignition on. And if you didn't do it in a certain way, the car wouldn't recognize it properly. Add to that, the earlier cars, because they didn't have U.S. regulations, there was a lot of the buttons that weren't labeled because they didn't have to be in Europe. And so the start button was this very simple looking, very pretty aluminum kind of dome shaped button, but it wasn't labeled and it wasn't labeled start stop. It didn't look like anything. It could have been a button to do whatever. So again, there was a the, the big ignition switch that when you flipped up, but if you didn't know where the start button was to run the engine and had done all of the things prior to that, the car wasn't running. So once I knew that it had battery, I grabbed a five gallon gas tank because I didn't know how much gas was in it. And I put gas in it, also figuring the gas was probably old. I got the doors to pop open with the remote, which was super cool. And you know, it, nobody had ever seen anything like that. You hit the button and the doors swing open on, on just air actuators. It took me almost an entire day of like, I'm gonna figure this out. I had installed car alarms and car stereos earlier on in my career. So I, I knew the Clifford system a little bit and you know the immobilizer system was, was there. And I finally get to the point where I, I did the sequence and I turned the Audi key and like all the lights came on. I was like, oh my God. So then I start looking around, I flip the switch, the lights are on in the dash, everything's coming on, where you know, windshield wipers going, I'm, I'm, I'm playing with all the switches, making everything work. So I see the button and I'm like, it could be the start button. And I hit the button and it fires up. Now keep in mind, the car was in the center of the DuPont showroom, which was this carpeted office and it was two levels. On the top level was everybody's cubicles and desks and, and, and offices and things like that. And it opened up to the museum on the ground floor. So where the spiker was at the time was dead center of everything. So when I fired this thing off, and this was an early car without the sport exhaust, so it was just straight open exhaust on the Audi V8, which is a gorgeous sounding motor when it's been kind of unbridled, this thing just roared. And I'm sitting in the car and the car's running and I look up and the entire glass railing that overlooked this museum was everybody had poured out of their cubicles, poured out of their offices. Everybody had come out. What was that noise? What came out? And I'm sitting there and I'm looking up and I start revving the car and everybody's screaming and it was crazy. And I was like, 
well, it's running, but in reverse, <laughs> pull the car out and I pulled it out in the parking lot and I got to drive it through the parking lot, drove it down the street. I didn't want to get out of the car. I finally put it back into the show and I close it and I called Martin, I get Victor's number and I call Victor. I was like, your car drives amazing. And he's like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, I was like, I got it running. He goes, you got the car running. He goes, the purple car in the United States. I go, yeah. He goes, that car's been there for four or five months. He goes, it's been to all these dealers. He goes, none of the transport guys have been able to get it running. And I was like, I figured it out. I was like, and I drove it and it's amazing and I love it. And so from that point forward, well, even while I was working at DuPont, I would take my weekends and I would escort the car with journalists or I would drive the car. They entrusted me to drive the car in photo shoots for advertising and for these other, you know, magazine articles and things like that. So that's how my career with Spiker got to the point where they, you know, it got where they were ready to launch the car. They had their deal in Edward and they said, hey, come work for us full time. That happened in 04, and then I stayed helping them through most of 05, and then I think in 06, they offered me to go full-time with them, and I was their dealer operations manager, which none of us knew what the hell that meant. We had Rona, which was our product specialist, and then Karsten, who handled all of the upper management stuff. He was marketing, he was sales, he was, you know, handled the paperwork, and then, you know, Martin kind of was behind the scenes. I was the guy on the ground driving the car, fixing the car, and I got to do all the training. And I did that uh, from like 06 till 2010. And I was at Pebble Beach, and Renee from Lamborghini came up to me and said, hey, listen, you know, I had, over the years, I had gone to all of these auto shows. And when you go to the auto shows, you're with the same people. You're the first ones there setting up the booths. You're the last ones there tearing stuff down. Renee was always there with Lamborghini, you know, and he says, hey, listen, in a couple of months, we may have an opening in our after sales department. You know, would you be interested? And I was like, yeah. And this is right when the Saab stuff started happening with Spiker. I decided, even though the Saab ended up being something that didn't happen with Spiker, it actually worked out really great because I left right before everybody found out, and I started my career with Lamborghini in, in 2010 and worked for them for a few years as well. If I was to guess on the mileage, I mean, I know I put 15,000 miles on 083 myself, I mean, between all the rallies and then all the other cars. I easily have 30 or 40,000 miles between the ailerons, between all of the different customer cars, between all of our press cars all over the world, the rallies that we had done, I would easily estimate 30 to 40,000 miles of street miles. and a handful of track miles as well. The Spiker came on the scene and no, nobody had seen a car built like that in decades. It really much was a throwback to the, the, the early, early, early cars. And when I say early, I mean 1920, 1930 kind of cars. The Spiker, I think overall, ended up building a little over 250 cars, almost 260 cars worldwide. So it was a very small manufacturer. The company had been around since 1907. They built airplanes at one point. They competed in the 1907. Peking to Paris. And to imagine what that's like now to drive from Peking to Paris, could you imagine in 1907? But they used a lot of the history of the car between the airplanes and, and their race heritage. I mean, you know, Spiker was the first motorsports sponsorship that anybody had ever seen. Louis Vuitton sponsored them in the Peking to Paris race. And so they had the Louis Vuitton luggage that they took with them on the race. And again, that was another element they carried into the modern car that you could buy custom Louis Vuitton luggage. But the car, nobody had seen anything like it. It was all aluminum hand-built aluminum at the time, 2,800 pounds. They, they grabbed a, a V8 engine from the Audi uh, A8, which was an amazing sounding motor, had fantastic torque, and they essentially took the front drivetrain from the Audi and grafted it into the back of the Spyker and turned a, an, an all-wheel drive car with a front engine into a, a, a mid-engine car. Upgraded it with a little bit of the RS4 clutches and some of the drivetrain parts in the transmission, but essentially it was, an, it was an Audi, you know, basic Audi drivetrain, so it was very simple, about 400 horsepower, which at the time didn't sound like much, but when you put it in a 2,800-pound car, it went pretty good. You know, they wanted it to be art, and they did. Uh, you had raw aluminum in all of the trim panels. You had, uh, you know, hinged pedals, which nobody had ever seen except for some BMWs and Porsches, but all three were in a very small pedal box. You had a very small steering wheel with no airbags. You had amazing brakes, but no ABS. You had a, a manual steering rack. Everything in the car was designed to be something to where the driver was the one controlling all of the inputs in the car. And likewise was any performance that you extracted from the car was responsible solely for the driver. And at the time where everybody was going to F1 transmissions and traction control and all these things, Nobody got a chance to really experience a car like that. I mean, unless you were driving a Caterham or, you know, a first-gen Miata or something like that. But to wrap all of that amazing driving experience into what essentially was art first, 
every detail of the car. I mean, there was no plastic anywhere in the car. The, the door panels were, were, were formed aluminum with leather stretched over it. Every switch was designed to have a certain noise so that you, and a tactile feel, so that when you flipped it, it was positive that you were wanting something to happen. And it wasn't an accidental, oh, I brushed against this button and something happened. There was no stereo in the car. There was a handful of owners that added it, but like, didn't need it. There were some additions that didn't make it to the US cars where you had a, what they called a periscope mirror and they had this gorgeous polished aluminum contraption to, to create the, the rear view mirror to go above so that you could see behind you a little bit better uh, when you had the top open. You had a, a hand formed steering wheel that was, you know, hand wrapped leather. It was completely dangerous to, to drive behind if you were to get into an accident, but to look at it, it was the centerpiece of the whole car. And then of course you had the, the exposed shift linkage, which is really the signature piece of the interior that stood the spiker out from everything else. Because not only did you have a manual transmission in a world that was transferring to F1, you had a, you had a, a, a gear shifter that you could see both sets of linkages, the, the main bar and then the bar that kind of moved. And as you moved the shifter, everything moved in front of you. It had never been done before. Nobody had it. They didn't know what to think about. And so many people would get in the car, they couldn't figure out where's first gear. How do you drive? You know, what, what is it? They just, they, they didn't get it. They didn't understand why. But once you sat in the car and you were enveloped by this leather and this aluminum and everything having a, just such a, such a feel and a, and a, and a touch to it that it, it really was, a, it was something very, very, very special. Finding good quality used cars is harder today than it ever has been, and the best way to find one is by using Auto Tempest. Auto Tempest is where I start most of my days searching for my next car because they compile the results from all the major sites into one place. They support VinWiki, they support CarTrek, and we love them for that, but honestly, I love it because it's the best way to find your next car. They've even got an app now, so download it, check it out, and have the power of Auto Tempest on your phone.